Hey y'all, it's Wheela and today I'm coming to you giving you a Glossier Serve. You know, I'm trying to keep it skin first because we are going to be discussing, reflecting on the impact of Glossier. So if you want to know more about that, then please stick around. Recently, BOF um, released this article titled How Glossier Lost Its Grip. It was written by Rachel Stugertz and it's on BOF if you have the subscription and if you don't, like me, I have the 30 day subscription that ends in like two days, so that's why I'm on this today. So we're gonna be going through snippets of the article. I'm also gonna be sort of reflecting on my personal takes on it as we go through and that's just, that's just how we're gonna do it, okay? When Glossier launched in 2014, it was entirely new, both in its messaging, be you, just do weird, and then and its direct to consumer sales strategy. I actually just want to halt right there. Um, so Glossier began in 2014 by Emily Weiss. She had a beauty blog, lifestyle blog called Into the Gloss. And from there she had launched these three products. I believe it started with three products. And you know, Into the Gloss had this really, um, sort. it was very targeted towards like millennial girls that are into beauty lifestyle and all of that stuff. Now, I kind of want to set the scene before Glossier, you know, before this whole wave that we're seeing in beauty. Makeup in 2014, 2015, beat, slay, beat, slay, beat, slay, bake, beat, slay, bake, okay? <laughs> Everything was beat and slayed down okay like you had to, you had the contour and concealer arithmetic okay you had to do like pemdas here and have a trapezoid here so that you know it could really give you a snatched angle everything had to be snatched brow was snatched brows on fleek do you all remember brows on fleek pay our sister brows on fleek. Listen, if your highlighter didn't blind somebody from the reflection of the strobe of the highlighter, you were doing something wrong. This was the full glam smoky eye era, okay? This is the era of makeup that was there before everything was a full beat. For a girl like me, this was a very intimidating world. I've always loved makeup. I've always played, I used to play in my mom's makeup, but I was extremely clueless and I didn't have the funds nor the super interest in learning the techniques. Um, I loved to wear eyeliner. I used to love wearing a cat eye and I used to love wearing a red lip, you know, but beyond that and beyond that short period where I put blue eyeliner all over my eyes, um, <laughs> I, I was quite clueless when it came to the technique of makeup. And as far as the social media space of makeup, the beauty community was very much still in this teaching era. So a lot of um, things were tutorials, a lot of things were how I do my blank this, blank that, smoky eye this, whatever. And then came Glossier. Okay, and Glossier was all about skin first. And you know the first thing that really sucked me into Glossier was that when you saw the girls using the products in their marketing, they only use their fingers. That was the thing that I was looking for. After I saw that marketing, I was like, oh, I have found the makeup that I've been looking for. This makeup is for me. Glossier was not the first no makeup makeup kind of brand. You've had Bobbi Brown, Bare Minerals, Laura Mercier, you know, these people, these brands have existed before, um, but a lot of them, one, you had to go in store, most likely to Sephora. I don't, I never really enjoyed going into Sephora. Yeah, so it solved this technical aspect that I was very intimidated by with the full beat sleigh makeup. It totally eliminated that. It eliminated me having to go into Sephora. The price points felt attainable. And also their strategy in using micro influencers. Also, when it came to the micro influencers that Glossier 
chose, a lot of them were like these naturally stunning, just clear skin people. So when they're using Milky Jelly and their skin looks amazing, that type of strategy really worked for them in the beginning. It felt like cool branding, and especially now that I'm a designer that works within marketing, oh, this strategy was gold. That millennial pink, the millennial pink, and I think it's Helvetica, right? Like they use Helvetica quite a bit, um, sunsets. They had crafted this Glossier girl perfectly. You knew her lifestyle, what she ate, and how like effortlessly pretty she is, and all of that stuff. And Definitely most of us ate into that, you know, persona. It just, in a way, it felt really organic. It was speaking to this rise of minimalism and effortlessness and skin care, skin first. And I really do think that they deserve their props for, you know, being a part of that, you know, movement in beauty in particular. Countless beauty labels mimicked Glossier's heavy use of social media to connect with their communities, as well as its millennial friendly pink branding. I just want to say that a lot of times when I look at a lot of these new beauty brands that are coming up, I don't think that it's a bad thing to see something that worked and maybe think that it, it'll work for you, but it's getting a bit boring now. Like a lot of times I'm just like, this is just another attempt of Glossier, but like with different color branding or, you know, like mix it up, do something fun, do something different. I also want to say another thing I didn't point out that made Glossier, just adding to that cool factor is that they never had traditional stores right so they had these flagship stores that were like an experience like i remember maybe the second or third time i went up to new york city to visit my friend i was like i have to go to glossier like i would never say that i have to go to h m or i have to go to zara also the setup was curated it was more so a curated space than a store pause random thought that i remember too was that emily weiss majored in studio art at NYU and I always felt that Glossier stores leaned more so into the concept of an art installation rather than a retail store so just food for thought and it was no cash and just the way that it looked was super Instagrammable like from the time that you step in and then throughout the store, everything was Instagram ready, which I know we might cringe at now, but I think for the time, people were just into that content wise. Like when I really think about how I followed Glossier, I really was into the brand and less into the makeup. But even as it reaffirmed its unicorn valuation last year, which their valuation was $1.8 billion. Woo. The company's troubles were mounting. Glossier Play, a more pigmented and glittery makeup sub-brand launched in 2019, launched in 2019 to, mu to much fanfare, but failed to catch on and was quietly discontinued at the start of 2021. Yeah, see, this is the time when I fell off of Glossier. I remember seeing Glossier Play and just being like, what are they doing? I just, I didn't understand it. It was very much giving milk makeup for me at the time, which I love milk makeup, but I also really loved Glossier for different reasons though. And I know a lot of people are like, Glossier's products are not special. Like there's really nothing like cool about them. I really have to disagree. I think when it comes to um, the makeup we see now, like cream products and liquid blushes and all of that, Glossier was a part of that and it was again something that I didn't have to be super technical with. I think Cloud Paint is still a really great product. Um, Boy Brow was a great product. I do think that they had a few standout products to me, mainly Cloud Paint. I really think Cloud Paint for me was like the creme de la creme of Glossier. I also like the perfume. And not only that, but they would also, you know, sell these hoodies or water bottles or whatever. Again, going back to that strategy. But 
I do think that they have products that are well priced for the market that they're trying to target. In August of 20 in August 2020, out of the gloss, a collective of anonymous former retail employees emerged to challenge the brand's welcoming image. The group published an open letter on Medium and created an Instagram account to air grievances ranging from racism to toxic workplace culture. Now, I remember when this was happening, I believe this was like the, I don't even know which wave of BLM this was at the time. Um, but a lot of companies were doing the like, we see you, we hear you, and then you would end up having these marginalized employees that just felt total discrimination, um, every ism, but were actually speaking out about it. And Glossier was not the only company that came under fire. I rem remember Reformation, some writers that were writing for these like hip places, I think like Nylon and Vogue and these places where they haven't even gotten paid. Um, it was real wild. Even Everlane, I think, was a part of that. Yeah, I do think, I know that they have this sort of grant that they give to Black-owned businesses and some of them I've been really interested in. Um, but you know, do with that what you will, do the research, see if you wanna still buy cloud pay and call it a day, you know? The whole picture of it being this like sort of ethical clean beauty brand was just like, mm, went in the tank. And on January 26, Glossier laid off about a third of its workforce or more than 80 employees, which the company called a difficult but necessary decision, adding that these changes leave us well positioned as we continue to grow the brand long into the future. Now Glossier is challenged with writing the beauty playbook it helped define, breathing new life into branding that had grown stagnant and drawing new younger members into its customer community. So the rest of the article kind of goes through why they believe the downfall of, downfall of Glossier happened, but I wanted to sort of uh, dissect those things for myself. And of course, let me know what your thoughts are down below. Obviously, number one would be the panoramic. And I just don't know how much you can talk about that without like your video not being able to exist or something, I don't know. But I would also say there's been a social change in what we want from our brands. And I just don't think that people are buying into the effortless Glossier girl anymore, the girl that's naturally pretty and dabs on nothing. Um, I don't think that people are interested in the lifestyle of the Glossier girl anymore. So there's just a general disinterest in that sense. I also do think there was a memification of Glossier that started happening. Recently, I had watched, I was watching this James Welsh video where he was kind of doing an anti-haul and he talked about Glossier being this kind of cult because there was such a cult following that Glossier had and I think there started to become these memes that were coming in about girls that wear Glossier or this is such a Glossier girl and I think that served them really well in the beginning because I think that's the result of really strong branding to be honest but there started to also become this Glossier fatigue again because like most of these Glossier girls were just naturally stunning you know didn't really have a job but had a fabulous apartment like you know what I'm talking about you know what I'm talking about you know, and aspirational marketing just isn't the thing right now. Like, you know, there's havoc in the world. These leaders, like, I don't need to remind y'all today, but you know what's up. You know what's up in the world. And so the type of marketing that, you know, a company like Glossier used to serve us in like 2018, 2017, it's not gonna cut it. We're gonna shut that down today. So I think they also have to kind of find their footing in that sense as well. I also think we are in the infographic era of the internet and that has also trickled into the beauty space. People care about ingredients. People care about where the what the formulation is and where the products are coming from. They are doing the research and 
Um, I don't think that Glossier tapped into that soon enough. A lot of brands like CeraVe and Cetaphil are, um, you know, coming back into the mainstream because people genuinely don't want any frills or anything extra fluff sold with their product. They just want, you know, a sort of earnestness with the products that they're buying. A lot of the top kind of skincare influencers were never really that impressed with Glossier. If anything, they probably um, slandered some of Glossier's products and just have a general um, real disinterest and almost dislike for Glossier and write it off as gimmicky. And I think that had a lot of impact. I also believe that Glossier rode on the girl boss era and that is so repulsive to most of us at this stage in the game. The girl boss era is over, or let me not say over, it's taken on a new face. We'll name it and, you know, articulate it maybe a little bit down the line. We're not into it. We're not into it. Oh, this is another one. I think a lot of people are really interested in these sort of legacy brands now, right? Like, I feel like there's a resurgence in the skincare space, but also in the makeup space, you know? Even me, I'm interested in like Dior, you know? I like Pat, you know? I like these brands that have sort of proven and established themselves and aren't just selling me a trend and so I think that's a huge part of it. When it comes to makeup trends, glazed donut is out. Dewy skin, we're not even wanting dewy like that anymore, to be honest, like, to be frank, I just want natural looking skin. I don't want it to be matted. I don't want my skin to be matte and I don't want my skin to look like something could slick and slide off of it. Like, I just want my skin to look natural. I don't want a glazed donut vibe, which Glossier girls were serving. I also don't want a matte vibe. I just want to look natural. And I think as far as makeup trends, um, powder is back. Powder is coming back. Um, thin brows are coming back. Um, there's a lot more manipulation um, coming back within makeup. There's more technique coming back within makeup. And um, Glossier is just a little bit too dewy and effortless for that vibe. I've grown up, and I think that might be another part of it too, that the millennial girls are growing up. The Gen Z girls are even growing up. The z millennials are growing up. And, you know, we're wanting something less trendy and something more earnest and grounded, if that makes sense. I think that Glossier can come back. I think that they can still make products that people are interested in. Overall, I like Glossier still, even though I don't necessarily, um, I'm not eager to buy products the way I used to be. I was absolutely obsessed. Like all my friends know, I loved Glossier. So let me know your thoughts down below. That's all I have for y'all. And I'll see y'all later. Bye.